This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning, Northway. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. And I thank him for the opportunity to, again to speak with you. And I don't know, I feel like, it seems like the people want to praise this morning. You want to just praise God for a couple of seconds? Just put your hands together and thank him. I'm just feeling that this morning for some reason. Hallelujah. Oh, he is worthy of our praise. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is worthy. He is worthy. On the good days, he is worthy on the bad days. And I'm just really just thankful that uh, you have been with my family and I over the last few years, and especially the last year during my illness and my continuous recovery. I'm still recovering. I'm, I'm standing now. Yeah. But there's, there's still a long way to go, and I just, I just thank you. I know that there's many people uh, hurting, uh, just health-wise, or maybe in the family, or maybe you're just suffering because of your family. Yeah, yeah I get it. But in all that, it's good to be part of a family like Northway, that we would care for one another just as God cares for us. I think that's important. I think God blessed us, and I'm very grateful, and I'm thankful for him for that as well. So here I am today. I just stopped north of me to talk to you and to finish up our series, 490. 490. Pastor Kent talked last week about forgiving ourselves and understanding the forgiveness of God and, and what that 490 means. It's like forgiving someone 400 and 90 times, I don't know, I don't think I could be able to count that high, you know, I'm, I'm kind of from the, the old school of forgiveness. Yeah. You do something to me once, shame on you. You do something to me twice, shame on me. The third time, you're going to pay for everything you've ever done to me. <laughs> I think that makes me about three short, so I, I still got 487 more to go. But no matter how it is, God calls us to forgive because God has forgiven us. That 490 really means to infinity. And we heard the story, the first part of the story where the master forgave the ser servant for messing up or mismanaging the money, which would be worth today, what was it, Pastor Kinson? Like, 20 years of salary, I couldn't imagine. And we would think that if that would happen, that this guy would skip all along and next time someone does something to him, he would pat them on the back and say, don't worry about it. But the Bible tells a, a different story. And I want you to read it with me. Now, I'll read it, you can listen. Found in Matthew, beginning at chapter 28, it says, but when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, way less than he owed. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and he pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will repay you. He refused and he went and put him into prison until he should pay the debt. When the fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and you should not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And Jesus said, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brothers from your heart. Forgiveness, forgiveness. I, you ever had to forgive someone? You ever really had to like, I don't know, it may be simple. Maybe someone just cut you off in the road. And 
You were driving and we got to church, you saw him there. <laughs> and she was like, I'll never let them in my small group. <laughs> maybe it's, you felt neglected or abandoned and you had to forgive. Maybe you were abused or maybe something happened inside of your family. But it seems like that, that forgiveness is, is something that we have to grapple with as, as Christians. We have to struggle with it and, and kind of figure out what is God saying. Do, is, is Jesus really saying 490 times? It can't be. Let's look at forgiveness. I, I had to find out the definition for myself, share it with you. In one illustration, it says, forgiveness is the intentional and voluntary process by which a victim undergoes a change in feelings and attitudes regarding an offense. It says, let's go of negative emotions such as vengefulness with an increased ability to wish the offender well. So I got to forgive them and I got to say to In the Greek, it's just simple. It says you have to show favor. You have to pardon someone or show kindness. One of those fruits of the Spirit. But again, I'm going to say that there is difficulty in forgiveness. I, I just remember my forgiveness, you know, before really giving my heart over to God and, and, and needing to forgive. Probably about 24 hours ago, right before the first sermon. But you just think that if someone had done something to me, I wanted them to pay. Like, they owed me something. Like, there was some sort of retribution that I should receive because someone hurt me. It doesn't matter if they abused me or they neglected me or, or if I felt like they stepped on my foot or no matter what it would have been, I, I would have thought that they would have deserved not God's freedom but my revenge. Even looking in the Bible, and I, I see the story of Joseph, and I, and I read that story, and I see, you know, he had a little swag to him. You know, he was excited. He had a nice little coat, and he bragged to his brothers, and he was having these visions. He said, I'm, like, much closer to God than you. And then they, were, they weren't having it, so they took him, and the, they put him in a ditch, and they left him, and they sold him into slavery. And he goes through this horrible time. But then he becomes the leader of a province over in Egypt, over in another land, and his land becomes famished, and now the brothers are, are looking for food, and they're about to die from starvation, and they have to walk thousands of miles, and they get to their brother, and then Joseph, and they knock on the door, and Joseph recognized that it's them, and he opens up the door, and I said, man, slam that door back on them. But the Bible tells a different story. I look at this text, and this man, he, he would, this servant, he would receive forgiveness, and then walk down the road, and and it didn't say the first person he saw, he grabbed that person. He said he found that person. He finds this person so that he could put his hands around their neck and choke them because of the money that he owed. And, and I wonder what that would look like today. I think Jesus stood up here and said it once. But if you had a million dollar in account and you blew it at work and you go in the office and you look at your boss and you're ready to be fired, and he looks at you and says, don't worry about it. Go back to work. Would you go back to your department and begin to fire everyone who was part of that account? Or would you pardon them? I hope you wouldn't fire them. Many of us who have walked the walk of Christ, we know that if we are forgiven, that we should offer the same forgiveness to others. Yet we still see in our own lives that it's hard for us to forgive co-workers and friends and sisters and brothers and fathers and mothers and children and wives. It's hard and more difficult for us to pardon them. I must admit that it is difficult. It's difficult when you have to forgive in those situations. When you've been a husband or a wife, a spouse that has been cheated on, but yet you're, you're called to forgive. You have been neglected by your parents and by your family and, and everyone's saying, oh, just forgive them. Go hug them and go call them and have a great time over the holiday season. And like, I'm not going to be phony. But God wants us to forgive. But it's not easy. I think part of the reason why it's not easy to forgive because we are hardwired to retaliate. 
I mean, it's deep ingrained into some of our families. I think about my family, aunts and uncles were in disagreements when I was younger. And I, as I got older and become adult, they were still in disagreements. So that was a fabric of who I become. In our families, it's a fabric of who we become. That's how our society operates. That's how our family operates. So it naturally is going to come inside of us, and we're going to operate the same way, and you're going to be just like me. Like, if someone does something to me, I'm going to get them back. I'm not going to give them a second chance to stab me in the back. Amen? <laughs> Y'all missed a chance. Sometimes you got to let it go. The Bible says the only unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So why is it so hard for us to forgive? Being hardwired. Sometimes I often think it's protecting our emotions. It's another reason. Is we... Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that if somebody's doing something to you, you should not continue in that situation unless they stop. But that doesn't mean that you have to become angry. You see, I remember 24 hours ago when I would get angry at someone or someone would do something against me, it was this pride that would begin to grow up inside of me. And I would walk around, I'm, I'm not calling, I'm not answering this phone call. I'm not answering this phone call. Turn my back, I'm not talking to them over there, so and so. I'm going this way, I'm not coming to my small group. I like that, that's a good word. But then I had, to, I had to hold on to that pride. And the only way I could hold on to that pride was through anger. I had to become angry at that person. I had to become upset. And then anger began to, to take over me. And as I became more and more angry, I began to hurt the people who were around me. Protecting myself. I had to maintain that pride. And then there's that downward spiral. But with that difficulty, there are consequences to an unforgiving nature. There are consequences. I would, took my wife out. Every now and then we go on date night. When we're really tired, we go like once a week or something. And sometimes we go to the movie. It's really not the best date night because you're not talking to you. You're just watching the movie. But as long as I know she's there next to me. Anyway, we went to go see uh, The Judge. Someone recommended it. It's a great movie. It has many different uh, scenarios running through it. But as a pastor, I, I picked up one particular. See, there was this judge, and he was prominent in his small town. And he had a son, and his son was a big-time lawyer in a big city. And something happened in their family that... They were no longer talking for years, but then they had a tragedy, and the tragedy brought the family back together. But the two, the husband, I mean the father and, and the son, every time they were in the same room, everyone else would be on the edge of their seat, and they would be wondering, like, who's going to explode? What's going to happen next? You, you ever been in a family situation? And like, you're wondering, like, oh, goodness, why did he show up today? But it disrupt their family. And then another tragedy would happen, and, and it was still that same unforgiveness. They had to begin to work through it. But it disrupted their lives around them, the people around them, the, the, the lovers they had around them. All that became disrupted, you see. And that sort of thing, it, it becomes bigger in our own world. Because that sort of unforgiveness would have nation fighting against nation. It would have nation within nation fighting its own self. It, it would have the communities like we see with the violence in the communities and murders in the communities and, and people killing and murdering because someone owes them a dollar or, or 50 cent or even something more. It disrupts the world around us. It seeks into our homes and it breaks up our families Husbands and wives and brothers and sisters going deeper and deeper. And not only that, it, it begins to affect our health. You see, unforgiveness generates healthy bodies. We destroy ourselves with it. 
Unforgiveness has been medically proven to generate anger and resentful thoughts and feelings. It creates stress that can lead to suppression of the immune system and even heart problems. This has been medically proven. And any time we go over something over and over and over in our minds, like, why did he do that to me? Why did they do that to me? I can't stand them. Oh, I hope I ever never see them. And over and over and over and over again, then mental illness can fall into that. All because of an unforgiving nature. Then we begin to lose the battle within. So we spiral down. We're losing the battle within. If you don't believe there's a, a battle within, I'm talking about that spiritual battle. I'm talking about the battle where there's good and there's evil and then there's God and then there's Satan and then there's the kingdom of heaven and then there's the ram of the kingdom of the enemy. That battle was there, but that battle is also in here. When we have unforgiving hearts, you, you see, we put a, a divider up between us and God and allow, we become all Satan's own playground to do what he may. If you don't believe me that there's a battle out there and within, just look on social media, look on the television. See some of the images that they show our children. It's not all bad, but look at some of those images. Like, give me your phone, boy, what's wrong with you? Look at the martyring that's going on around the world where people who are praising God and lifting up the name of God. And today, right now, today, they are being murdered because of what they do. The evil that's rising up around us, there is a war within, and we want to be on the right side of that. Why grieve the Spirit? The Bible says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom we are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and the clamor and slander be put away from you along with this malice. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God forgave you. It's simple. We forgive because God forgave. We don't hold that in and of ourselves. Romans, Paul tells us, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will replay, says who? The Lord. Many of us walk around and say, it's me. I'm going to get them back. Y'all still with me today? This is a tough one. Don't be mad at me. I got the message from above. As I traveled, you know, through life and Talking with Pastor Ken, we were looking at, like, what's this? How did God for, forgive me? And how did that begin to forgive some, some other people with that? And, and we started to look at, like, God forgives. Like, that's the first thing we have to recognize in our heart. We have to recognize in our heart that God forgives us. No matter what we have done to someone else, and we have done some bad things to other people, we are the one that has cheated on the spouse. We are the one that may have done something that someone did not like, or we cut someone off in the parking lot. And we need God's forgiveness. We need God's forgiveness for us and for that other person so that what we have done does not block their blessings. And God graciously gives that. He did it. He gave his son on the cross. He said, here, this is for you. This is for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time we take communion, we remind it. The blood has been shed for your sins. Because God forgave. We forgive. And once you have that in the heart, once that division between us and God has been broken down and, and shattered and, and whatever numbers were between us and God have disappeared, subtracted themselves away, then we learn to forgive others. Because now we have a heart, a posture to forgive ourselves. I can look in the mirror again and I can say, man, I love that person. And then the Spirit uses us to forgive others, to be an example of forgiveness to others. I think in my own life, I had this guy, he was working with me, he was a friend of mine. He was an older gentleman. He was working with us down in Homewood. 
We were asking him to help us to strategize. And he came down, he just started taking over. Like, I ran million dollar companies. I know how to get this stuff done. I was like, but this isn't a million dollar company right now. This is the people who are in the community of Homewood and we need your help. So we didn't start listening. So he started going around to the people who were funding us. He was like, well, they just don't listen. They, they're not doing it my way. So we, we sent them off and said, man, you can't be around because it's just negative energy. I love the guy. The guy would come back and he would do it again. He said, we're going to trust him this time. He would come back and he would say, you guys just don't know what you're doing. And I'm like, all right, you got to go back again. Now, it's been about the 10th time and he's still working with us. <laughs> But God, we're talking to him, we're discussing it with him, and God is using that opportunity for him to understand our culture and us to understand from where he's coming. Forgiveness. Understanding that. You see, we forgive by faith. I have a friend, and you would think my friend is doing very well, and, and he is. He has a wife. He has sons, he has daughters, he has a house, he has a white picket fence, and he even has a dog running around the yard. So you look at him like he is a picture perfect thing of success. But he tells his story of, of feeling neglected when he was younger because his parents were working. And they were never home. So he, he looked to find with inside himself someone who can comfort him. And he went out into the community and he found a baseball coach. And while he was out with that baseball coach, that baseball coach began to abuse him. Sexually. And as this man began to become adult, he, he started to feel the, those same sort of feelings, that bitterness. And it started going towards his wife and toward his children, and his family was almost disrupted. And I, and I asked him the question, like, what happened? What did you do? And, and, and he said something that uh, Pastor Kent and I, we were emailed by an elder. And it, it kind of made sense because this is what my friend was talking about. He said, you know what? I had to first learn to, to like forgive what I thought was owed to me. You know, that debt. Like when someone takes something from you, your spouse takes something. Like I was with you 10 years. I should have been happy. I should have had a car. My kids should have been in a good school. I should not have been going through 15 years with you. You owe me my 10 years back, so we're never going to forgive them. That, that young man, he, he felt like he, he deserved to have a, a young father a father with him cheering him on during his games and being there as he grew and became a man and have him next to him. Like, they felt like they were old, so they had the first thing about, like, I have to forgive that debt because that's not really, that doesn't belong to that person. Like, God put me in this position because I'm in this position to serve him. And as, as that may sound, there's no mistakes. We don't allow things to keep happening to us. But when it does, we search for God in that moment. We give it to God. And then understanding that, that God will give us that process. You know, some of us, we need processes. But what I was saying last night, that despite all those processes, there's not 490 pro I read 12, I read 3, I read 4, I read 6. I did not read 490 processes of forgiveness. So there has to be some sort of equation here. He said it was by faith. Like we forgive by faith. It's the faith that God gives us that we can do something that's not about us, but it glorifies our Father which is in heaven, that his kingdom may overrule all things that are going on. You look at the Bible, it's by faith. That Abel gave a better sacrifice. It was by faith that Abraham just decided to, to up and leave his family. It was the, this by faith that the same Abraham would, would go out and he would be called to take his son and sacrifice his son for his living God. And he would take him up the mountain and he would even draw back his sword to begin to kill his own son just by faith. By faith, Moses will walk and, and he would see the sea part. By faith, Jesus would be in the garden and say, let your will be done. It is by that faith, same faith that the Spirit gives us the ability, the power to forgive other people. No matter what's going on in our life, there's power in that forgiveness that the Holy Spirit, that the war that's going on around us can be won, but it's one person at a time. And each time 
that unforgiveness mounts up, it gives points to the enemy. Last I'm going to say is there's no limits to forgiveness. The Bible says in Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive what grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord, what? Forgave you. So here's Peter and here's Jesus. And Peter just heard this great methodology that works for many people. Peter, as Pastor Kent said, you know, he was a zealot. You know, zealous were the Jewish type that they didn't take any mess. If you did not obey the law, they were going to get you. I mean, he was a guy that his faith was always being challenged. And he was talking to Jesus, and Jesus said, well, if you, someone does something to you, what do you do? You go approach them. Hey, man, you messed up. If that doesn't work, you take them before the elders. And if that doesn't work, you take them before the church and you flog them. The Bible didn't say that. The Bible didn't say that. Jesus actually said, you treat them like the pagans and the tax collectors. Now, Peter, being smart and a little astute, he, he thought about it. He said, well, you got a tax collector on your team. You love pagans. Like, what's going on? Like, how many times should I actually forgive? And then Jesus tells him. You know, he says, should I forgive seven times? You know, seven was the, it, it was the most perfect number. Seven angels, the seven lampstands, seven birds. Seven was that number of completion, like that was it. Should I forgive them seven? And Jesus said, no, you have to do it more. You have to forgive until infinity. You have to forgive and forgive and forgive. You have to give pardon. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to be inside of you. You have to be that dwelling place. There's no limit to forgiveness. I'm going to try something. I remember when we were young and we were in Sunday school. We would take these pieces of paper and we would fold them over, put tape on them. Then the teacher would tell us to take another one and another one. Next thing you know, we had this long chain. And she would tell us, as the chain gets bigger, it gets heavier, and we would be so excited. And she would say to us, and I share with you, like, this heaviness, this chain, is every time we don't forgive someone, this chain gets heavier and heavier, and it begins to bird us down more and more and more. And we were acting it out like, oh, I can't bear this chain. And then she would tell us to just start tearing the paper up. And we were so excited. One, we got to tear all the paper up. But we understood. And as we began to forgive more and more and more, it became more light and more light. And we began to celebrate that. And I want to encourage you in that. As you forgive, as God calls you into this world of, of, of spiritual living and of forgiveness, all your burdens become lighter. The things that worry you wouldn't worry you. You can look at the news and you can see a situation like ISIS and you can say that God is going to take care of that situation. There may be some things that we might have to partake, but God ultimately is going to take care of the situation. That we have the faith to understand that even though it seems like we haven't talked to family members years for, for years or, or even decades, that God can put in his spirit, in his place, that even before I pick up and I make that phone call, that his spirit has already touched the person on the other line and they are ready to receive what I am ready to give. And if they're not, I did it for the Lord. Let forgiveness be in your hearts. God just says, let's just think and settle on that for a little while. And while you do, I'm going to ask Pastor Kent to come up and pray for us. I tried to screenshot something on Facebook. It might be relevant. Read over it while he steps up.